In this episode, we compare and contrast the costumes from two period television crime serials, The Alienist and The Frankenstein Chronicles, coming up. Welcome back to another episode of Costume Co. I do almost weekly videos analyzing TV shows and movies from a costume perspective, and I also live stream every Saturday. So I just finished watching both The Alienist and The Frankenstein Chronicles, and while the stories are different, they both had so many things in common that I thought it would be fun to do a comparison of the two shows. So if you haven't seen either show, I highly recommend them. So for the purpose of this video, it will be a spoiler-free video on Season 1 of both The Alienist and The Frankenstein Chronicles. Let's proceed. Both shows are set in the 19th century. The Frankenstein Chronicles is a procedural investigation into the supernatural. And while shot in Belfast, the story is set in pre-industrialized 1827 London, just before the founding of the Metropolitan Police Service in 1829. The costumes are designed by Irish costume designer Susan Scott. The Alienist, meanwhile, takes place in 1896 in New York City, which was in the midst of the Gilded Age, which is a period of time in the United States that dates between the 1870s to the turn of the century. This period of time coincides with the Victorian era in England. Costume designer Michael Kaplan told Gold Derby, I always loved the contrast between the various levels of the society, the Victorian society and the seamy underbelly, and the tenements, the Italian tenements, the Irish tenements, the Jewish tenements, just the melting pot that was New York at the time. Kaplan said of the alienist's historical accuracy, we did not want it to be stylized like a lot of other projects of the same period that are kind of winking at you with contemporary elements mixed in, the Victorian era British series Peaky Blinders being one. Director Jakob Verbruggen said it's only going to work if we do it true to the period, so we did. Kaplan also said Mara Lepere Schloop, the production designer, gave us all such an amazing background for the actors to perform and for my costumes, and we try to base it in reality as opposed to doing something very stylized, which seems to be the trend right now with a lot of period movies of around the turn of the century. The Frankenstein Chronicles protagonist is Inspector John Marlett, a Thames River police officer investigating a mysterious child murder. Marlett is played by British actor Sean Bean. As the River Police were full-time salaried officers, they weren't issued uniforms until the Thames River Police were eventually absorbed by the Metropolitan Police in the 19th century. Previous to this, they were only issued great coats, like we see in this opening scene. During this era, society was broken up into class systems, although Professor Catherine Hughes states that the number of people who counted as middle class began to swell and men became defined by their jobs rather than their family background. This beehive illustration by George Cruikshank depicts the hierarchy of the class system in London during this time. Originally sketched in 1840 and here reprinted in 1867, the beehive showed English society divided up by class and occupation. By using the image of the beehive with its rigidly organized layers, Professor Hughes stated, Cruikshank was celebrating the class divisions at work in British society and also depicting them as natural and unchanging. Marlott's clothes reflect his station as a middle-class man. He is always well-dressed with good classic pieces and warm tones and not as on trend as we see in the other upper-class characters. In these images, he's wearing a shirt with a stand-up collar, flat front trousers, a waistcoat, which is a type of vest, and a simple cravat. His vest is high-waisted and squared off at the bottom, which is more in keeping with Regency fashions from the previous decade. Here's the ensemble topped with a coat. This coat features M-notched lapels, which was a fashion style particular to the early 1800s. 
There is some tailoring through the back with a center back seam and side back seams and two piece set in sleeves. The sleeves have no gathering. Again, this was just starting to come into fashion. Marla wears riding boots, a commonly worn type of footwear for men during the day. On the right is a pair of leather riding boots from 1815 from the Kyoto Costume Institute's collection. Here's another look for Marlet. The fact that he owns more than one suit and one that is almost in new condition shows that he has some means despite living a rather modest life. This stiffened stand-up collar and the wide lapels of his coat were in fashion during the Regency period. The brown tweed waistcoat is double-breasted and also has wide lapels. And he's wearing a felt bowler hat with a grosgrain ribbon band. Here's yet another overcoat with M notch lapels. This coat has sleeves that have a slight gather at the shoulder, and I'm not certain what type of hat it is, but it looks kind of like a felt telescope hat. Here are two examples of early 19th century overcoats. On the left is an example of an 1820s man overcoat after conservation by the Scottish Conservation Studio. And then on the right is an 1830s great coat from the John Bright collection. And just to let you know, the gray coat is cut like a frock coat with a flared skirt seamed at the waist. The alienist protagonist, meanwhile, is Dr. Laszlo Chrysler, a psychologist or alienist called upon by his former Harvard classmate Theodore Roosevelt to try to get into the psychology behind grisly child murders. Chrysler has much in common with the fictional Sherlock Holmes with his powers of observation. And in a common trope, both Chrysler and Marlet are damaged in some way with skeletons in their closets, a flaw that drives them, but also often puts them in mortal danger. Of the alienist protagonist look, Michael Kaplan said, Chrysler was a young man, but I kind of wanted him to feel a certain kind of maturity and wisdom. And then assistant costume designer Rudolf Mance adds, for Chrysler's look, we wanted to keep him very serious, studious. So this old-fashioned look is achieved by dressing Chrysler in double-breasted frock coats with peaked lapels, which had become more reserved for more uh, formal occasions and less fashionable as daytime attire worn by young men in the late 1800s. Here are Michael Kaplan's sketches for Dr. Laszlo Chrysler's looks. A daytime jacket look, a frock coat ensemble, and a white tie and tails ensemble. And then Kaplan said, what I do generally is after reading a script and getting a feeling for each character, I assign each character a color palette. It's not that heavy handed, but just so that they are each defined and easy to recognize. Dr. Chrysler, Kaplan states, his palette was blacks and dark greens, and he's a little more old world. I wanted him to have a European feeling in his clothes more than Moore's. It's all about defining the character with color and texture and different motifs and the different types of cravats they wear. Kaplan also had to keep New York weather in mind, telling The Hollywood Reporter, The story spans three seasons. It starts in winter, goes to spring, and there are even some summer clothes. Kaplan adds, there are a lot of coats. The one you're referring to in the interview is a wool coat with a big Persian lamb collar. I was conscious of not going to furriers to get fur. A lot of times on projects, mostly Star Wars, I would use faux fur, but it does photograph differently. So I went to thrift shops in Budapest for old fur coats, which we dyed and cut apart so we weren't going to furriers and buying new fur. I was cognizant I shouldn't be using fur at all. Actor Daniel Bruhl said of his character's costume, the clothes make you walk and move differently. You have your pocket watch, your cane, all these things help you in understanding the time and understanding your character. Gentlemen and ladies would always wear a hat of some kind like this bowler that we see here on Chrysler. On fitting Bruhl, Kaplan said, Daniel looked at it in a technical way and he'd say, I feel the character, this will work. Here's Chrysler's frock suit on display, a special exhibition by Pentagram of artifacts from the series. The double-breasted frock coat, like the one seen here, was sometimes called the Prince Albert, named after Queen Victoria's consort. Here's an example of a man's 1897 frock coat, 
waistcoat and trousers from the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Made by Philadelphia tailors Matson and Dilks, the coat and vest are made from black wool flannel, while the trousers are gray and white striped wool twill. Unlike our modern day suits, coats rarely match the trousers or waistcoats. Like a capsule wardrobe, pieces could be mixed and matched. Here's a close up of Chrysler's footwear, a brogue boot of sorts. His shoes and pant legs are muddy to reflect the filth of New York streets. And then here's Chrysler dressed in his formal attire. The standard pieces of this suit include black tails and button fly trousers with a satin stripe down the outside leg, white or cream waistcoat and white bow tie, and a white shirt with a starch bib, collar, and cuffs. This example of a man's 1900 starch linen collar is from the museum at Fit. Collars like this would be attached at the back of the shirt with a button and then were closed at the front buttonhole with a stud like we see here. According to Fit, detachable collars such as these were an important element of fashionable menswear during the early years of the 20th century. The detachable collar was invented in Troy, New York as a solution to the endless laundering required of collars and cuffs in order to achieve the flawless requirement of fashionable gentlemen. And makers of this collar, the Arrow Shirt Company, became the largest collar, cuff, and shirt factory in the world. Here's a collection of a variety of styles of Arrow collars. So typically, turn-down collars were worn for daytime, while stand-up and wing collars would have been worn with formal wear, like we see here. Created for television, writer Benjamin Ross incorporated real-life British characters into the fictional telling of the Frankenstein Chronicles, the story intertwining them throughout Marlott's investigation. The Frankenstein Chronicles is a reimagining of Mary Shelley's 1818 novel that she wrote at the young age of 20. And the show also includes her husband, the romantic poet Percy Shelley. Mary Shelley was a well-educated woman of some means, coming from educated middle-class parents. As an accomplished editor, writer, and novelist, she also had her own income, so her position in the beehive would have been near the top, and her clothes show this. So in this picture, Mary is wearing a police, which is an early 19th century women's outer garment. Here's an example of two English police coats from the V&A in London. On the left is a police coat and collar made from brown silk taffeta from about 1818 and on the right is a silk police that's lined with silk satin and cotton and it's made circa 1820. Here Mary is wearing a day dress with a sleeveless spencer cut with the same fabric as the cuffs. A spencer was a short over jacket usually worn outdoors as an outer garment. Here's an example of a French woman's cotton plain weave Spencer jacket, circa 1815 from the LACMA. This is the same dress except that Mary has replaced the Spencer with this fringed fichu of sorts. This dress is from an earlier time period and we know this because of the empire waistline of Mary's dress which is much higher and the bodice shorter. Here are two dresses from the early 1800s separated by a little more than a decade. On the left is a pretty cotton and silk dress from 1810, and according to the Met, they say the style persisted until the 1820s when the waist slowly lowered and the skirts became more bell-shaped. So you can see by the ivory silk damask gown on the right uh, from about 1821 that the Empire waistline was beginning to drop. This dress that we see here is from the Kent State University Museum in Ohio. Ross also cleverly includes English poet and painter William Blake. Another significant historical figure in the Frankenstein Chronicles is Sir Robert Peel, the Home Secretary and also Marlette's employer. In real life, Sir Robert Peel served twice as Home Secretary as well as Prime Minister of the UK. Peel is regarded as the father of modern British policing, and an interesting fact is that British Bobbies take their name from Robert Peel's first name as he established the Metropolitan Police in 1829. As Home Secretary, Robert Peel is upper class and dresses in aristocratic, Regency-style fashions. He dresses in cool tones like blues and greys, with ruffles and flounces in juxtaposition to Marlott's no-fuss style. 
His outfit consists of a double-breasted navy tailcoat with brass buttons with a collar featuring the M notch, scoop collared white shirt with front ruffle and starch white cravat, brocade vest and gray flannel flap front pants. While the waistcoat collar is often worn up like we see here, uh, there was a variety of turned down styles as well. Here's an example of an M-notched coat collar and stand-up vest collar featured in this 1809 painting titled Portrait of a Man by Francois-Xavier Faber from the National Galleries of Scotland. Here's an example of this type of coat from Carrie Taylor Auctions. This naval double-breasted wool tail coat dates about 1815. And finally, here's another man's tail coat, probably English, from the Los Angeles County Museum of Art that dates between 1825 and 1830. This wool, plain weave coat with hints of its military influences buttons all the way to the collar, although the fashion was to wear it open or button just to the bottom two or three rows. Robert wears a beaver top hat and black wool gray coat with a contrasting velvet M-notch collar. And unlike the frock coats, gray coats would often button below the waistline. So Robert finishes off his look with leather gloves and a walking stick. This informal dressing gown worn at breakfast has contrasting quilted cuffs and a shawl collar. This style of robe is a precursor to the smoking jacket, an item of clothing suitable for receiving company in informal situations. Here's a beautiful men's dressing gown from the Met, dating between 1820 to 1830. This French robe is made from silk with a contrasting shawl collar and cuffs in the same fabric as the robe lining. The story also incorporates Charles Dickens working as a young journalist at the Morning Chronicle under Dickens' real-life pen name, Boss. Today, Charles Dickens is regarded by many as the greatest novelist of the Victorian period. Here's a portrait of the author at the age of about 27. Now, compared to Marlott and even Robert Peel, Boz is a bit of a dandy with his ruffled cuffs and oversized bow tie. Boz's burgundy velvet tailcoat has slightly gathered sleeves, contrasting velvet cuffs, and an upper collar. Here's a close-up of his costume. Under his coat, he's wearing a striped waistcoat, and it looks like his bow tie is a sort of paisley print. During this time, while the coat was most often a solid color, it was common to see these contrasting textures with the vest and tie. Here's an example of the style of tail coat from the 1830s. The coat is featured with cotton twill trousers and a cut velvet pattern vest with a shawl collar. In Caleb Carr's fictional telling of the alienist in both the novel and the series, he includes two key figures amongst others in the story. So we have Theodore Roosevelt, then the newly appointed commissioner of the NYPD, and J.P. Morgan, a financier and banker. In reality, Theodore Roosevelt was an American statesman and writer who served as the 26th president of the United States, while J.P. Morgan Sr. was an American who dominated corporate finance and industrial consolidation in the States in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Kaplan had no trouble determining how to dress the historical figures in The Alien as saying, there are a lot of real-life characters in the series, like J.P. Morgan, Teddy Roosevelt, and a lot of the famous gangsters, so it's very easy to research them. With research today with the internet, it was easy to kind of look them up and see how they presented themselves, how they dressed in those days. Kaplan, who has worked most recently with director J.J. Abrams on the sci-fi giants like the new Star Wars and Star Trek franchises, stated, It was quite a nice change for me to get back into costume houses and to be doing research and going to research libraries, and I enjoyed that very much. I enjoyed that process. Here, Teddy is wearing pince-nez, meaning to pinch the nose, which was a style of corrective lenses that Roosevelt was known to wear. Here are a few examples of suits from this era captured in these cabinet card photos. This Brooklyn, New York gentleman pictured on the left from the 1890s is wearing a three-piece sack suit. And on the right is a close-up of a shirt, collar, vest, and jacket. Roosevelt and Chrysler are the same age, but there is a large contrast between the two. Roosevelt often wears three-piece sack suits in a variety of tweeds and twills. 
Sack suits had been in fashion for some time, but it was the Brooks Brothers, America's oldest men's clothier, that introduced the uniquely Ivy League sack suit in 1895. Teddy Roosevelt was a frequent customer of their clothes. Here's a picture of Teddy Roosevelt from 1897, just a year after the year this series is set in. And it's likely that the design team, perhaps with Brooks Brothers' help, determined the fabrics and shape of his suits during the late 19th century. A fun fact is that Roosevelt commissioned Brooks Brothers to create this dress uniform for the Spanish-American War. And on the right is Robin Williams as the come-to-life statue Teddy Roosevelt from the movie A Night at the Museum. Here's one of my favorite suits of Roosevelt, this chocolate brown, double-breasted, widely spaced pinstripe suit. After Michael Ironside portrays J.P. Morgan, who was known for his W.C. Fields type nose. According to Today I Found Out, Morgan didn't just have a bulbous nose, it was also purplish red because of a skin condition he suffered from as a child known as rosacea. J.P. Morgan was so subconscious of his condition that he was known to violently lash out at anyone who attempted to take his photo without his permission. You might also remember that J.P. Morgan was depicted in E.L. Doctorow's novel Ragtime and later the movie. And Michael Kaplan tells Gold Derby, I knew that there was a reality being interwoven through the movie, The Alienist, with the likes of Teddy Roosevelt and J.P. Morgan, and it just seemed like such a visual feast, and I think it did turn out to be that. And being an older gentleman, J.P. dresses more traditionally in muted grays and blacks, and in this picture you see that, like Roosevelt, Morgan wore pince-nez glasses worn around his neck on a chain. Here's a few pictures of Morgan with the glasses. I don't have dating on this picture, but it's likely the early 1900s. And in both pictures, he's wearing a high-buttoned waistcoat, a pocket watch, shirt with a wing collar, and a cravat with a frock coat. Here's Morgan in the show, wearing a close facsimile of the clothes from Morgan's real-life portraits. Now, for fun, I thought that I'd include actor Kate Dickey, who portrays two low-level criminals in both of the shows. So you might recognize her from her famous portrayal of Liza Aaron from Game of Thrones. While here, she's Mrs. Bishop, the matron of the gang of murderers in the Frankenstein Chronicles. And in The Alienist, she portrays Scotch Ann, the owner and proprietor of The Golden Rule, which is a basement brothel employing young men who present themselves as female. Joseph Nightingale is a Bow Street runner and John Marlett's right-hand man, sort of the Watson to Marlett's Holmes. The Bow Street runners were London's first professional police force. Nightingale has essentially one set of clothes and cool tones. While he is employed, he is still early in his career as a constable. His one coat shows signs of wear with darns. In this shot, you can see some of the darns on his coat. His well-worn topper is velvet covered. Nightingale's overcoat is single-breasted with the M-notch lapel, as we've seen earlier. And it looks like it's an oil cloth with a good amount of breakdown by the wardrobe team. And I'll add that the breakdown in this show is some of the best I've seen on TV. And John Moore is a New York Times cartoonist and illustrator, as well as a society man who attended Harvard with Dr. Chrysler and Roosevelt. Moore is the ideal sidekick for Chrysler, although there are times when their relationship is adversarial. Of John Moore, Kaplan said the crime reporter Moore is a bit of a dandy and bon vivant, meaning one who lives well. He has these brocade vests, stylized hats, and his color palette has different shades of gray and blue. Kaplan adds, I think director Jakob Verbruggen really blessed us all with his casting. It wasn't really befuddling or difficult to dress these characters as I saw fit. It wasn't like sometimes it's difficult when you have something in your mind's eye and the casting is 360 degrees away from what you're thinking. I thought that the characters Luke and Dakota and Daniel were so well cast and so right for their roles. Actor Luke Evans says of his character, John Moore is a privileged man and he's had quite a privileged life. He likes to have the entitled experience of, you know, going to the theater, drinking in nice bars. 
Here, Moore is wearing a striped cutaway coat, which is a semi-formal daytime garment for gentlemen. It's similar to the frock with a waist seam and attached skirt sitting close to the body, but the skirt cuts away from the body instead of dropping straight down at the front. And he's wearing matching pants, although as I've mentioned earlier, these clothes could be interchangeable with other pieces. In this image, you can see that the collar of the jacket is bound. Here is Moore without a jacket. His waistcoats are made from a variety of brocades and silks, both single and double breasted with shawl and notch collars. Moore often has a fob, which is a small ornament attached to a watch chain hanging from his welt pocket of his waistcoat. And unlike his co-stars who were a little less fussy about their costumes, Kaplan states that Luke Evans' fittings would go on for hours. He loved the clothes. I wanted to take the mirror out of the fitting room. He'd say, don't rush me. I'm admiring myself. Can I put on that coat again? Here are Michael Kaplan's costume designs for John Moore in casual, semi-formal and formal wear. Kaplan said, what I usually do with characters is create a color palette around them so that they can kind of live in that world and also do costumes that are designed appropriately. All of their clothes were made for them. We did make all the principal's clothes in Budapest where the show was shot and worked within their color palettes, as I was saying. Moore wears an assortment of woven silk cravats and neckties always fastened into place with a pin. In this picture, Moore is wearing a Homburg, which is a stiff, semi-formal felt hat with a center dent in the crown called a gutter crown. The Homburg is named after a town in Germany. Edward VII, the Prince of Wales of England, popularized the Homburg pictured here in 1890. In this picture, Moore wears a slightly more casual three-piece houndstooth sack suit. Here's Michael Kaplan's illustration of this costume. Here's a close-up look at Moore's boots with a built-in spat upper and, like Chrysler, showing some caked mud on the soles. Pictured here is Moore and company wearing white tie and tails. And I haven't pointed this out yet, but 19th century coats and tails have a separate cuff detail, something that you won't see in modern jackets. And no formal attire would be complete without a fringed opera scarf, white gloves, and black topper. This Brooks Brothers Black Beaver topper with silk grain ribbon dates circa 1890. According to the museum at Fit, top hats were worn throughout the day during the 19th century, but by the 1890s they were more often associated with formal attire. The top hat became fashionable during the closing years of the 18th century and remained an essential element of fashionable dress for men into the early years of the 20th century. Here's what the shirt looks like underneath the coat, with the collar removed, although you can see the stud has been left in the front. According to Brooks Brothers, part of the attraction of the detachable collar was the versatility it offered. And the bib in the front is usually starched and stiff and matches the single cuffs that are fastened with cufflinks through buttonholes. But double cuffs and French cuffs were also popular. Finally, in 1900, Brooks Brothers introduced the button-down collar Oxford, a classic shirt style that endures to this day. And that ends part one of The Costumes of the Alienist and the Frankenstein Chronicles. In the next episode, I'll get more into 19th century women's dresses when I analyze the costumes of ingenue Sarah Howard and Lady Jemima Hervey from The Alienist and the Frankenstein Chronicles, respectively. And if you like moody 19th century dramas, be sure to check out my video on the costumes of the gothic romance Crimson Peak.